Conway Hall, London, where ethics matter. Good afternoon and welcome to Conway Hall, to you in the room and to you at home on Zoom. This afternoon we're going to be talking about how Britain enriched the few and failed the poor, a history of 200 years. Our speaker today is Stuart Lansley, whose latest book, The Rich Are the Poorer, charts the story of a two century long high inequality, high poverty cycle, which was broken for only a brief period after the Second World War. He'll be asking the question, how have Britain's most powerful elites enriched themselves at the expense of surging inequality, mass poverty, and weakened social resilience? Stuart Lansley is a visiting fellow at the School of Policy Studies, the University of Bristol. He's written for many academic journals and newspapers, and he is the author or co-author of several books um, on this kind of subject, uh, including The Richer, The Poorer, Breadline Britain, the Cost of Inequality, and Top Man, which is an excellently titled biography of Philip Green. Welcome, Stuart Lansley. Okay, well, look, thank you very much for giving up your Sunday afternoons uh, to, to, to come and listen to this. But um, I, um, uh, what I'm going to really talk about is how Britain ended up near the top of the global league table for both poverty and inequality. I mean, it's not a record uh, uh, to be envious about. So, so what are the factors that have led uh, to, 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 to Britain's position near the top of the league table that most people would like to be at the bottom of? Um, I just want to start because I'm really going to look at the parallels between the 19th century and today I just want to start with two quotes from outside commentators. These were both people who visited Britain, uh, one in the mid-19th century and one in the last couple of years, to assess Britain's record. Uh, and the first one is actually by an American businessman. And you can see what he's saying. What he discovered in his uh, month-long visit was ignorance, coarse brutality, sullen help hopelessness, haggard wretchedness. And uh, uh, Philip Alston, um, who, the, the, from the United Nations, who, who came here a few years ago uh, and produced what was a pretty damning report of what he found, said something uh, uh, pretty similar. Um, now, Britain is very much an outrider when it comes to other rich countries. What this graph shows is, is, the, is how well off the poorest fifth are in other rich countries compared with Britain. And you can see that, for example, that the poorest fifth in Germany are a third better off than they are in Britain. And the same, something similar, slightly lesser with, with other rich countries. Essentially, Britain is a generation behind uh, when it comes to how we've treated our poorest uh, citizens. And if we want to see what's been happening, this is, this is what's been happening in the last 40 years. It shows the increase in poverty and the increase in inequality. And you can see that poverty has broadly doubled. It's more than double for children. So nearly one in three children of the official government definition are poor in Britain. But while poverty rates have been going up, so has inequality. So one of the, one of the characteristics that this, of Britain that this graph shows is that poverty and inequality uh, tend to go together. And this is not just true of the last 40 years, it, it's true of the last 200 years. And what Britain has had is what I've called a, a, a long cycle, a long inequality-poverty cycle. Uh, over these 200 years. And this cycle uh, has had three distinct waves. Uh, the first wave was up in the 140 years up to 1939. This was up, this is, both poverty rates and inequality rates were very high. Then we have uh, the, the post-war period when this was, a, this was a, a, a better phase, poverty and inequality rates fell, 
but they only lasted for about 30 years, this reduction. And then since then, we've gone back, essentially, to the high inequality, high poverty uh, cycle of the 19th century and the pre-war period. Now, it's very interesting because, uh, I don't know how many economists are here, but cycles are quite endemic uh, to economies. Uh, the business cycle, the sort of boom and bust cycle, where, you know, economies speed up and, uh, and, and then suddenly crash and so on, is endemic uh, to, to e e e economies. You know, they're the, and the, but the cycle, they're kind of natural, uh, and, but they are very, very short. Now, the thing about the poverty inequality cycle, it is not, it is not natural. It, it is an artifact. It's, it's a cycle, it's also much longer, whereas the business cycle lasts about a decade or may, maybe two decades. We're talking about the first cycle lasted nearly a century and a half, and the present cycle has already lasted four decades, and if anything, inequality and poverty are still going up. So there's no sign whatsoever that we're coming to the end of this cycle. Now, the, 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 the reason that, that, that what determines ultimately the level of poverty and inequality in society is essentially the kind of power games that take place between boardrooms and business leaders and financial elites on the one hand, on Whitehall and government reaction on the other, and the power of civil society on the other. And what's happened is that these power games have been, have been won uh, essentially by an, in, in, a, a corporate and financial elite for, for, for four-fifths, more than four-fifths of the last 200 years. It's only a single generation when we've had a more equal balance between these uh, relative forces. Um, so, one of the big reasons for this cycle, uh, and the fact that egalitarianism has only really won the argument for such a short period, is what I've called the ideological tug of war. Um, about uh, the shape that societies should take and, and how much inequality there should be. Now, if, if we look at um, the, the first period, 1800 to 1939, and what Eric Hobsbawm um, dis described as the, the age of capital, this was a plutocracy. This was a society run pretty well throughout the whole century uh, by uh, uh, essentially uh, run by the rich on behalf of the rich. Um, and uh, they had very, har the, the, the very, very harsh attitudes indeed towards the poor. The poor were largely dis dismissed uh, as self-inflicted. What help there was for the poor was very mean and patchy and harshly delivered. And the question of inequality was more or less ignored. It wasn't an, an issue. Uh, classical economics essentially argued that any gap that existed was the product of economic forces and you shouldn't interfere with it. If people were very, very rich, it's because that was good for society and if people were very, very poor, it was down to their own fault. So there was no need for state intervention to try and do, do something about it. Uh, now, gradually, these very harsh attitudes um, they, 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 they were taken on by social reformers and, and, and p politicians on, on the left. Um, and they gradually run, won the argument. And so, uh, and so uh, the egalitarian school um, essentially won, won the battle in, this partic in the period after the war. Um, and one of the key architects of, of the idea of egalitarianism was Richard Tawney. I mean, I've put up um, his blue, blue plaque here. Uh, he's very, one of very few social scientists who, who've actually got blue plaques. Um, but um, he basically said, he was one of the first to argue that you cannot separate the question of poverty from the question of inequality, that they absolutely go together. And unless you tackle inequality, you will not tackle poverty. And, and th this... this um, idea was taken up uh, by a variety of thinkers and certainly by uh, the early founders of the, uh, of the Labour Party. Um, and uh, so, 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 so 
what we have in this short egalitarian period, which has been described as one of egalitarian optimism, uh, was falls in both inequality and poverty. Um, now, it's very interesting because the economic, the most uh, significant economic theory of, the, of, of that period um, was actually written by Simon Kuznets. Simon Kuznets is a, was an American economist and a Nobel uh, Prize winner for economics. And he theorised that what happens in societies is that, that when they're developing, and capitalism is developing, then inequality will grow. Um, so you have the upward, the upward bit of the graph. So inequality grows. Um, and then it flattens off as societies become more socially conscious, as democracy spreads, as gov governments are under greater pressure. A a and so, you know, policies come in. And then after that, inequality will begin to fall. So he was talking in the, in, in the 1950s. And his theory seemed to fit the, the history that we'd had to date, i.e., that uh, inequality had risen quite sharply, and then it had started levelling off after the war. But unfortunately, uh, this bit of the theory was right, but this bit of the theory proved to be completely uh, wrong. Um, although, of course, he was right in one sense, in, in that that period, post-war period, was a period for peak equality and the lowest point for poverty. You can see that the sh income share of the top 1% was at its lowest point in the mid-1970s, and then it carried on going up again. Uh, I, mean, I, you know, it, I don't know how many... I mean, I, I certainly lived through the 70s and remember it quite well. It didn't feel like it at the time that the 1970s was the best we were ever going to get, and it would all go downhill from then. Um, but but that, is, that is the fact. Um, now, what happened next is that uh, the, the social democratic philosophy that was kind of dr driving this egalitarianism uh, began to be countered by a group of new right thinkers who argued essentially that inequal uh, equality had gone far too far, uh, that what we needed was a stiff dose of inequality in order to get the econ economy going. Um, and this, the, the idea that inequality is good, a good thing, good for society, good for incentives, and will you know, drag everybody else up, beca slowly became the dominant philosophy from the mid-1970s. I mean, if you look, Keith Joseph, who basically says, if we try to make incomes more equal, we'll end up as a totalitarian slum. Totalitarian slum. Now, this view is still dominant today. It's still taught in university economics. It's still, it's still dominant in Whitehall. Um, and Robert E. Lucas, who's another Nobel, American Nobel Prize winner, who's one of the architects, is the high priest, if you like, of the market revolution of, of the last 30 years. He's gone to say that the most poisonous um, issue in economics is to focus on questions of distribution, i.e. how we divide the cake and how equal society. That's how strong uh, the opposition to egalitarianism became. And unfortunately, although the Labour Party was actually born as a egalitarian party, um, it, it has started, it started changing its mind uh, from the, uh, pretty well from the mid-90s mid and, and uh, the, the t when Tony Blair set up New Labour and won the election in 1997. And Tony Atkinson, who some of you may, may know of, who unfortunately died a couple of years ago, but Tony Atkinson was probably Britain's leading expert on inequality, uh, has this, this phrase, which I think really does kind of sum it up. You know, the, the commitment of the Labour Party to equality is rather like the singing of the red flag. Uh, those on the platform seem to have forgotten the words. Uh, uh, and, you know, he, so he's basically saying, although they were pro-equality, they never quite knew how to uh, bring it about. Um, and this, interesting enough, is, is un under New Labour, what happened is, is that Gordon Brown and Tony Blair launched this war on poverty, but they thought they could solve the problem of poverty without tackling the problem of inequality. And inequality rose under Labour quite sharply, which is the main reason why they weren't very successful. They did have some success. They did cut poverty rates quite a bit, to their credit. 
but because they didn't really tackle the endemic nature of how inequality it, 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 it creates poverty, uh, they were unable to extend that success. This actually is a Conservative Party poster uh, in the 2010 election. And, you know, it's somewhat ironic that the Conservatives attacking Labour because they failed, failed to um, reduce inequality, when, of course, uh, all their policies uh, added to it. So that will give you some idea of the sort of politics of the time. Now, I just want to come back to these two high high poverty, high inequality waves, the, the, the pre-1939, the first one and then the third one. And what is, I think, is particularly significant about these periods is that the poor law, uh, the poor law which was um, uh, the, 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 the way that the Victorians tackled poverty by essentially very, very harsh measures that forced people to go into workhouses if they, if they were destitute, um, that treated them as paupers uh, and you know, had very, very coercive and disciplinary policies. Um, uh, the, 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 that sort of thinking is, it isn't, it, isn't, it isn't the same today, but the shadow of the poor law very much hangs over poverty policy today. So some of the basic tenets of poor law thinking, that poverty is self-inflicted, it's the problem, problem of the poor create for themselves. It has nothing to do with the structural forces that create unemployment or low wages or lack of opportunities and so on. Um, and so uh, what we've had is that in, in the post-war era, f following the Beveridge Report and, and the welfare state, is that the, 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 the beverage reforms abolished the poor law and we completely changed our approach to, to help, help for poverty. We, we changed it from this coercive policy, you know, to get people into work and give them a hard time, to one of entitlement, that if you have low incomes or you're on hard times, if you're unemployed, you are socially entitled. It was a complete switch in philosophy. But gradually that philosophy entitlement has been whittled away, um, and we are back to the, this, the, the way that we, you know, that claimants are treated um, very, very harshly indeed by newspapers. You can see, you know, the number of times the word scrounger was used in the year 2010 was 10 times the amount it was used in uh, the year of the millennium. Um, and we can see too, this is another Conservative Party poster for the 2010 election, which made it clear they were going to get very, very tough on, on claimants. Um, and uh, they introduced a system of sanctioning uh, in which uh, your benefits were withdrawn completely. And you can see that between 2010 and 2014, that there was this huge surge in the number of people who were sanctioned. In fact, there were five million people in this period who were sanctioned, which meant they lost their benefits altogether. And about two-thirds of those ended up with zero income. They had no income at all for a minimum of five weeks, and some of them much longer than that, depending on, you know... And, and two-thirds of those people who lost, who were sanctioned in this way, appealed and won their appeal. In other words, they were wrongly sanctioned. They should not have been sanctioned. The whole system of Social Security uh, became completely coercive. Um, uh, so, um, that's where we... Um, so I think the first explanation for this cycle is really to do with the battle of ideas and who wins it. And the egalitarians uh, effectively only won, won it you know, for a very, very brief period. But the second is the way the economy works. Um, and in both the high inequality waves, the first and the third, th that, were that the economy was characterised by what I've called very high levels of wealth extraction. Now, by wealth extraction, I mean the way... Uh, Smaller financial elites are so powerful 
that they are able to grab a disproportionate slice of the economic cake using mechanisms that are, are very bad news for other sectors of society. They're bad news for wages, they're bad news for taxpayers, they're bad news for social resilience. Um, and interestingly enough, um, this was recognised by classic economists in, in the 19th century. So, you know, I mean, the, the classical economists in the 19th century were pro-market. They were always seen as quite right-wing. They, they believed in very weak state intervention. They believed in the power of the capital. Uh, they did, they, you know, they... they, they um, yet, they all recognised what was happening in the 19th century. Um, Wilfred Pareto, which some of you may have heard of, quite a famous Italian economist, who basically said, we have to distinguish between two types of economic activity. The first is um, the, the actual production of economic goods, which is wealth creating and probably benefits society and benefits the economy. And appropriation, which is effectively the extraction of existing wealth using power at the expense of people who then lose that wealth. Um, and so the 19th century was, you know, was essentially the beginnings of this levels of wealth extraction. And, I'm, and I've given some examples here. There are so many examples of how this took place in the 19th century and, and um, in, in, you know, before uh, the Second World War. The pl pl a plutocracy, the plutocracy that we had in the 19th century, is perfect conditions for mass extraction. Because there's, there's no countervailing power. The union, you know, the labour force has no power. They have to take work or they end up in the workhouse. So the whole system was designed, in essence, uh, to create wealth at the top um, in order to build the economy. But, but this didn't really happen. You know, some of it did, but a lot of it uh, was wealth extraction. And there, there's, what I, I've argued is essentially what we had in the 19th century is the application of collective monopoly power by these financial, commercial, and corporate elites, which basically exploited labor, you know, took abnormal profits and rents, and were able to rig, rig markets. Um, now, again, I mean, I said, I, I gave you the example of Wilfred, uh, Wilfredo uh, Pareto, but the, these are two more, Adam Smith, uh, who, who is the patron saint of classical economics, uh, af after Keynes is probably the most influential economist of the last 200 years, and David Ricardo, who was another 19th century classical economist. Both, though they, the, the, both of them, even though they believed in free markets and, and weak states, they condemned the, a lot of this behaviour uh, of extraction. Um, or what, what David Ricardo called, called money for nothing, um, and what, what came, Adam Smith called rentier capitalism, where uh, the landlords and manufacturers uh, were able to create a surplus rent over and above what they deserve for the economic activity. So, um, and I want to just quote also these two, John Hobson and, 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 and Thorsten Veblen, uh, Thorsten Veblen's an American. They're all, they all wrote at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the uh, uh, 20th century. They, they, they were heterox. Um, they, weren't, they weren't classical economists. They were critics of classical e economics. Um, but what they talked about is luxury capitalism. What they said, what we created in the 19th century was a form of capitalism whereby uh, so much economic activity is created and, 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 and by, by the concentration of wealth at the top, that it, actually dis, that it actually cuts demand in the economy because the working class can't spend. And, and, and also a lot of it was in non-productive occupation. So what this, what this was, effect, effect, luxury capitalism was effectively doing, and we've got it back today, we've got luxury capitalism back today, what, what it was effectively doing was creating more economic shocks. Um, and the 2008 crisis was effectively the result of uh, luxury, luxury capitalism. Too much 
economic output and wealth concentrated uh, at the top. Um, so we're, we're um, so wealth extraction, you know, started in the 19th century. There was a whole series of mechanisms that were used. Um, they then pretty well went away uh, during the during the post-war era when business took um, a very different view of their responsibility. Um, and then it started coming back uh, from the early 80s. Uh, and essentially what happened was that, uh, that under the new right thinking um, that we need to weaken the state and, and inequality is a good thing, uh, and our, you know, the philosophy that was, 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 was effectively um, bought into by, by Mrs. Thatcher as Prime Minister, uh, what they did is they, they empowered, if you like, or licensed financiers and business leaders to try and get rich, to build big fortunes, and, and help them to do so by weakening, weakening regulations, particularly in the finance sector. And the aim of this policy was that this would unleash an economic renaissance and entrepreneurship, Britain would restore its place in the world, um, and that the wealth that was created as a result would trickle down and everybody would be better off. So we've had a 30-year experiment, if you like, 40-year experiment in inequality capitalism, and it hasn't worked. It hasn't delivered the economic renaissance. And Dean, our economic performance on every key measure, whether it be unemployment or growth or productivity, is worse than the regulated welfare capitalism of the post-war era. Uh, and part of the reason for that failure is that we've had wealth extraction has just come back on a big scale. And wealth extraction, you know, it, it reduces the level of productive investment, it, it reduces innov innovation, and there's just a long catalogue of examples of wealth extraction. I mean, many of you will remember, the, the, or maybe victims of, I certainly was, the victims of the mis-selling scandals in the 1980s, when um, if you took out a private pension, uh, which millions did, the first three years of payments um, didn't go into your trust fund at all. It was, ta it was taken in fees. Um, and there's lots of other examples of high power selling of financial products that were very, very, very bad value indeed. And that was effectively a, a form of transfer of incomes from ordinary people uh, to the executives of um, insurance companies and so on. Um, the, the, there's so many examples here. The skimming, skimming is, is the word that um, uh, traders use uh, for the ways they're able to skim off um, too much of the profit from trading. And they have their own phrases for this. The croupiers take is one of them. Uh, the bounce is another. If you've ever worked or know anybody who works on a trading floor, they'll be able to tell you how, how it's done. Um, but perhaps the, one of the most important examples of wealth extraction is the way that uh, the British economy has become increasingly monopolised over the last uh, 40 years. Uh, so much economic activity now is conducted in the hands of just a handful of companies. You know, house builders, supermarkets, uh, there's, a, the, 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 um, uh, there's so many examples. And um, monopoly we can see what's happened, how, mon how monopolised we've become, because um, about 30 years ago, the top 100 companies in Britain accounted for about a quarter of economic activity. They now, uh, they now account for a third. So there's been an increasing concentration. And if we look at t the big tech companies, you know, Amazon and Apple and, and so on, they are all monopolies. And they've become monopolies, essentially, by buying up the competitors. And, and, and uh, Mark Zuckerberg, um, the, the, you know, he's used this phrase, that what I wanted to do is create a moat around Facebook uh, which, to make it in, impenetrable. And it's no surprise that these companies, Apple is worth two trillion. That's the same size as the British economy. Um, uh, Microsoft is worth over two trillion as well. The other tech companies are worth over one trillion. The, 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 you know, these companies are worth more 
uh, than um, some countries. So it's not very surprising that it's very, very difficult to bring them to heel. It's very, very difficult to get them to change their predatory behaviour, to get them to pay their taxes, uh, and so on. So um, there is huge wealth extraction. I mean, the billions that these people are worth are the product of monopoly pricing and manipulation. Um, uh, so just a word about, pri well, we'll probably run out of, if anybody wants to talk about private equity, which is probably one of the biggest contemporary sources of wealth extraction going on at the moment. Um, so I just want to, th this graph shows the level of privately owned wealth as a share of the economy. So in, in, the, in the 1880s, you know, which was the first huge wealth boom, um, it was nearly eight times the size of the economy. Um, and 93% of that wealth uh, was owned by the top 10%. Uh, uh, and the bottom, the bottom 80% effectively owned absolutely nothing at all. Uh, that wealth pile fell in the Senate, partly because of destruction of wealth, but, but for other reasons as well. But we're now back nearly to where we were uh, in, the, um, in the 19th century, uh, where this time private wealth is um, uh, worth over uh, nearly seven times. Now, it's not quite as concentrated as it was, but it's, um, the top 10% still own half of wealth. Um, and if you want a measure of inequality, the, the ratio I prefer to use is, is the Palmer ratio. The Palmer ratio shows the ratio of the wealth held by the top 10% divided by the bottom 40%. And it's 10 in Britain. So the top 10% earn 10 times more wealth than the bottom 40% uh, together. Um, so I just want to say, I, mean, I, you know, I was saying earlier on that, um, that wealth extraction and, and, and the weak state regulation in, in the, uh, from the 1980s onwards actually ended up it, it delivering a very poor economic performance. I just put up one example here. This shows, the red line shows the profit share um, uh, uh, since the war and the bottom line shows productivity. Uh, no, the, the, the bottom line shows private investment since the war. You can see that um, during, during uh, welfare capitalism, uh, the profit share was pretty steady, but private investment grew quite sharply. But since then, the profit share has risen sharply, and therefore the wage share has fallen, but the level of the private investment has fallen. This is absolutely the opposite of the way uh, the, the release of private enterprise was meant to work. And it's the fundamental reason why we have this huge productivity gap in Britain at the moment. Um, I, I've probably gone on a bit too long, so um, I just want to, I won't talk about these lessons, I just want to sort of finish with this, this quote, which some of you will probably know, uh, from Leonard Cohen. Um, from his song, Every, Everybody Knows. The poor stay poor, the rich get rich. That's how it goes, everybody knows. Okay. <laughs>